Welcome back, everybody. Michael Fair here. Um, last week, I did not get finished with the perspective, but I'm going to get to that in a few minutes. But we do a couple warm-up exercises. And again, if you can hold your pencil like this with your middle finger and your thumb and involve the, the wrist and your elbow and your shoulder, you get a long, fluid mark. And you can just practice doing ellipses do them in different directions if you want it's just something to help warm you up um, you can take and I'll do this one first um, say you did an ellipse here and maybe an ellipse here Let's tuck one back there. Do a couple stems. A couple blades. Not blades, I'm sorry. Leaves. Now if we just open up a couple of these like buds. all these intricate paintings of uh, sea life, like seahorses or fish, or sometimes he does frogs and they're watercolor. And they are just like photorealistic and big. I mean, like four by five foot, which is a huge watercolor. And I mean, there'll be like 120 fish in this painting. And they're sort of like all alike. And so I asked him one day, I said, what kind of fish is that? And he said, oh, it's just some, something I made up. He said, I make all these things up. And I said, seriously? And he said, yeah, nobody knows the difference. <laughs> so what I'm making up now is like a made-up flower. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's sort of like a, a tulip, but not necessarily a tulip. So if you go back and you can use a, a smaller lead, or you could use this one and put a little bit more pressure on so I'm going to hold it more like this, and let's do a couple of these leaves. And it's always best to run things off the bottom of the paper. You know, like if I was going to do, say, a, a picture of a bird. Got a bird sitting here. He's got his tail out here, and he's got a little beak out here, and his little birdie eyes right here, like this. And he's got a wing, of course. He's got another leg over here. Little toes hanging onto a branch. I would never just chop the branch off like that. It looks like he's floating in air. If you bring that branch on off to the edge of the paper, you know, it looks like it, it could possibly be holding this bird up. So if you bring your flowers on down to here or to put, put them in a vase, like here, that helps. But anyway, let me get a couple more of these leaves going. If you notice, I got three leaves, and I got three buds, or three flowers now. You can go back and make one of these closed if you want. Remember, I, I told you about the birds making a nest in my wreath on the front door, haven't I? Yeah, those cardinals? Yeah, well, I sneaked up on them the other day because I can't really see them well through the, the glass on the door because it's frosted. Mm -hmm. And their heads are about, about the size of a quarter. I mean, they're. Oh. I just saw two of them. I don't know if the third one didn't make it or if he was like down under the other ones. It was one of those chilly days. Yeah. So they were all sort of like in there 
trying to keep warm. I guess Mama was out getting some food or something. I still haven't seen the father. Anyway, I'm gonna you know, bring these guys up. Open up some of these petals. So anyway, this is just a way to get started. Now, think of the basic shapes again. I'm gonna go back to these uh, ellipses for a minute. Say you wanted to do a still life. And, you know, if you look at a cylindrical shape, straight on, it's almost a rectangle. But once you start tilting it, and you see that back lip and the front lip, then you start seeing that ellipse. And again, whatever this curve is, this curve down here is the exact same thing. And this curve back here is a mirror image of this. So the more you tilt this, you know, the more you see down into the side of this cylindrical shape. But again, this and this are the same, and this repeats this in a mirror image. And if you keep turning it, you've got a perfect circle. So it depends on where the object is in relation to your eye. Like if I, I'm sitting here looking at it, I see this ellipse. If I'm holding up here, I see a lot shallower ellipse. But if I was gonna do a still life, say I wanted to do a cup right here, I have it sitting on a saucer. I don't like that saucer. This is the number two I'm using, but I'm not pressing hard, so it's easy to erase. Again, I'm holding between the middle and the thumb fingers or middle finger and thumb. Thumb's not considered a finger. But this and this are the same ellipse. Just like this is the same as this. If I wanted to have, say, a, a coffee pot here, or uh, let's do a teapot. Do a teapot with a lid. So again, this and this curve are the same. This curve here is a mirror image of this curve. But this curve and this curve should be the same. If I did something like this on another, say I did a glass, and I did the glass like this, there's the bottom of the glass. See, this is a lot thicker in between here and here than this is here. So this is out of whack compared to this. If I wanted to do this perspective, I'd have to make these fit this. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Thank you. So that's one thing to consider when you're doing objects like this. You know, you could do a whole tea service or you could do cans of tomato soup it doesn't matter what you do but as long as they line up this curve this curve 
this curve, this curve, you're in good shape. Um, if you want to do a glass with some water in it, here's a quick trip, quick tip, uh, or a vase and have some water in it. Again, water is one of those hard things to, uh, to draw. It's best if you can have a model, and I don't have any clear glasses with water here. So I can't do a complete thing. But say that this is a, a glass with some water in it. Here's the bottom of the glass. Here's the water inside that glass. And again, this curve, this curve, and this curve are going to be the same. And here's a curve. That's the top. This is the surface of the water. This is the back edge of the glass. The, what makes glass so hard is you've got this glass edge that's closest to you. You've got inside the glass. You've got the back edge of the glass. You've got what's behind the glass. And since glass is usually smooth and hard, you've got a reflected light back to our eyes. So you're dealing with like six different things. But say I, say I put a straw in this glass where it hits that water, it's going to be bent looking, something like this. That's one way you can help that illusion along that you've got water in that glass. Hopefully that helps warm you up and get you used to doing big circular or elliptical shapes. I think there's a lot more of those in nature than there are squares and, and things like that. Um, most of the man-made things we see have got straight hard edges. You know, you think about buildings and telephone poles and mailboxes and all that sort of thing. And they're boxy. Cars, trucks, train cars, all that sort of stuff. Again, they're boxy. I'm going to take this down again so it doesn't scoot around on me. I brought it a couple of pens and next week we're going to start with ink. Seriously, but this is an O1, so you get a line that size with an O1. I don't know why, but evidently I was in my O1 phase. I got three of them. This is a 0 .5, 0 .005, I'm sorry. So it's a very, very skin look, skinny little line. I'm almost afraid to, to push on that one. I, I might break the end of the, the uh, line, the felt thing. You can also get uh, what's called a sienna ink in these. If you don't want to just do black, get a different look to your drawings. These are very cool too. Um, I've shown you how to do the deciduous trees. Let me do a quick um, pine tree for you. I'm going to use a heavier pen for that. Uh, this is just a ballpoint pen. My cousin is the president of a business up in Roanoke, Virginia. He gave me one of these, and it's a very nice pen. You know, it's an off-brand, but it, it makes nice marks, and that's what I worry about as a drawer. And with the... Um, the, the deciduous trees, you know, we sort of start at the bottom and work up the way they grow, but with a pine tree type tree, I'm going to start up at the top and come down more like this. This may end up the fir. The thing about pine trees is there's so many different kinds of them, just like there are, you know, deciduous trees. Um, if you looked at different pines, you might see 
Some pine trees, you know, their limbs go up like this. Some of the limbs, they droop down like this. Some of them, they're staggered like this. Some of them, they're lined up like this. Some of them go all the way down to the ground. Some of them, once they get to a certain height, they start losing their bottom branches so they look more like this. So it depends on the kind of tree you're trying to do in your drawing. You know, again, just the, for a tree to fill up some negative space, that empty space in our drawing, our landscapes, this will work just fine. And I don't want to do these needles, these limbs of the tree with the needles as solid as possible. I'm leaving some, some air holes in here so the little birds can fly in there and, and get, their, get to their nest. I must have used that pen more than I thought I did, sorry. Got to the end of it. This is another one. This is a this is a roller ball, which is actually better than a ballpoint pen. It's more fluid. There's no resistance. These things just zing right along on the paper. I love them. So you know, just continue with this on. But again, if we were a bird and we're flying over this tree all the limbs don't just go like this they go more like this they go out like the spokes on a wagon wheel so you got to think you got limbs coming this way going out this way there's some in the back that you can't see make this a short one Make it like a little Christmas tree or something. Go over the top of it. This roller ball is also a little bit darker than that ballpoint, so that's why I did that. You can do the trunk right there. Or you have a couple coming off like that and then brown like that. But that's one way to do um, a pine tree type tree. Okay, back to the thing I didn't get finished last week on the perspective. You know, I was talking about always using a sharp pencil. These mechanical pencils always have a sharp lead and all you gotta do to advance it is just push on the end, the eraser there and most of them have the white eraser. So that's another plus. But again, we start with that box. I'll do this real quickly. I'm not gonna get real, real detailed. I wanna do some bricks, and I wanna do some shingles, and I wanna do the eave, because before, you know, I it said it looks sort of like a Monopoly house. It's gonna be a real short house, so I'm, I can just draw this in and not do anything with it. I need to put some vanishing points on the sides. And you want to put them on the sides so they your um, angle lines don't look like they're squished to unnatural looking angles. What I mean by that is get them further away from the sides of the paper and they just look better. They're not gonna be real sharp like this. They'll be more angled like this. Okay, so again, this is the starting corner. We're standing right here looking either this way or this way. Might as well give myself a body here or whoever. Okay, so all of the vanishing lines on this side 
go to the right vanishing point. So it's going to be like this. Go to the top edge of this box going in here. And on the left, they go to that guy. Oops, I didn't quite get to the... Top edge there, my bad. Okay, so... I also want to do a little scene today with a um, combination of a pencil and, and some ink, just to sort of get a feel of what's coming up in the next two weeks. Okay, so again, to find the center of this shape, I need to go from corner to corner, like I was cutting a sandwich caddy corner and just put a little X out here in the middle and then go from this corner to its opposite and do this again. That's the middle of whatever this shape is. I did not take plain geometry in, in high school or college. I took the bonehead math just to qualify for taking math. The highest I took was Algebra 1 and I took it in my senior year because I knew I, it was a requirement to get in the college I wanted to go to. And I had to get a tutor to, to get me through it. But once I got it, man, I was like, I was actually helping the teacher. You know, she was teaching eighth and ninth graders, and here I am, a senior. I said, here, let me help you. So I'd go around, and I'd teach the kids, <laughs> show them what I'd learned. I guess she appreciated my help. I don't know. Anyway. So this is where we were last week, basically. I know that this line is going to go to this vanishing point because, again, we've got the cousins. We've got one, two, three cousins. They're not triplets. They're close, but they're not exact. So it goes back over here. Now I've got to stop this line somewhere out here in space. So this is the cool trick. I know the distance from here to here, so I line my paper up on this corner. When I get to this other corner, I'm going to make a little mark, like so. I'm going to bring that up to the roof. And I'm going to make a mark right there. So I connect that dot to this line right here, that corner. That's going to be the angle of the roof. Now that's the Monopoly roof I was talking about. You know, there's no E, there's no overhang. Most roofs hang over. So here's what you can do. You can take your ruler or yardstick, whatever, and just extend this line out about that far. Need to do it on this side also. Now you need to go from that corner back down to here. You can measure this with the made up ruler like I did from here to here, or you can eyeball it like I just did. But now you've got a sense of an eave sticking out. And back here, you can extend this a little bit longer. following what this 
line is like that so now there's that hangover over there or overhang I guess I should say so now you have a place to st stand and not get wet when it rains okay so a couple different things if you wanted to do bricks or vinyl siding or rock or whatever kind of siding you wanted to do what I would do is come up the this starting corner I would make a mark it could be like every eighth of an inch every quarter of an inch just something to give you an idea I'll show you why I'm doing it here you do I'm going to do every eighth of an inch like it's going to be brick I will not go all the way up Okay, before I put brick in here, let me go ahead and put a window here. Since it's to the right of this vanishing point, it's going to go to, I mean, since it's to the right of this starting corner, it goes to this white vanishing point. Sometimes my brain works quicker than my tongue or vice versa. Not sure which. Some days I think. English is my second language. <laughs> you have days like that, Amber? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, sometimes I'm stuttering, and I don't know why I'm stuttering. It's like I can't get the words out. So, again, all the vertical lines are parallel with the sides of your paper. And if you can't sort of eyeball it, you can always use one of these nifty 45-degree angles lined up with the bottom of your paper and that'll make it perfect 90 degrees so let me do a, a window and a door on the front let's do two windows and a door in our search for a house we went to two yesterday and um, the first one we went to you know from the from the pictures on the phone, it looked really nice. And we got there, and um, it was not quite so nice. Uh, they had added a bow window to the front, mm -hmm. and they had not reinforced on either side of the bow window. Well, glass is heavy. Yeah. And it had started to pull the front of the house away from the rest of the house. Oh, Lord. I could stick my finger up between where the ceiling trim was, I mean, yeah, yeah, ceiling trim in the front of the house. That's an issue. Yes, that was a major uh, uh, no-go with that one. <laughs> they had a nice garage, double, double-decker garage. I could have used upstairs for storage and downstairs for my studio. And I looked on the right-hand side, and from the ground all the way up to the roof, there was a crack like this. It was cinder block, and it went up so far, and then it went over, and then it went all the way up. It was that wide. It's like the whole front of the building's gonna fall off. Mm -hmm. I'm like, we can't live in a place like this. And then we realized that the floors weren't level, and the ceiling had a big slope in it like this. I was just like. <laughs> well, that house is gonna <laughs> fall apart, literally. I said, you know, if I was 30 years younger, I could, I could make some corrections, but yeah. it's almost like you know, have to, tear it down with the foundation and start over. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I'm just making a big picture window here. Not a bow window. I don't care if I had <laughs> 144 square feet, I'd need 150 to draw in. Get that door going. I would just do a little window over here. Maybe a, maybe the kitchen's on the front and the sinks there. I can tell that's crooked just by looking. 
to do a better job. Yeah, it was off that. It was off that much. Okay, so anyway, since I put these marks here, all I have to do, ideally I could just drive a nail through here and pivot this yardstick. And then over here I could drive a nail and pivot it on the front. But we can't do that, so this is the way to do the bricks. And if you don't want to do every brick, I'll show you a way you can get around that and people realize, oh, this is a brick house. I mean, some people are really into patience and detail and that's great. I used to do all these architectural type renderings and even my watercolors were very tight. I, I, ever since then, I've been trying to loosen up. I took watercolor the first time in 1973, and the professor liked old barns, so I went out in the county, drive around trying to find old barns to paint. And, uh, and I'm still painting old barns, and I'm still trying to get looser with them. That's enough on that side. But over here, you'd have basically the same thing. I'm lining up with that same mark. That way you're not gonna have mismatched brick or sloping brick or sloppy brick or anything like that. The second house we went to yesterday, the um, realtor said, well, what do you think? And she was unlocking the door. I said, this is, the, this is the crappiest porch I've ever stood on in my life. <laughs> Somebody had taken two by fours and two by twos and made the porch out of it. And, you know, there was no rhyme or reason. Like, part of it, the, the part that should have been on the deck of the porch was about this far up above, up above a shingle. They had nailed into a shingle with, you know, where the handrail should have gone. It just made no sense. And we got through the house and looked out the back window and there was one on the deck, on the back deck. And in one corner, instead of using one piece of wood, they pieced together three pieces. I'm like, you just don't do that. It's not safe. It's unsightly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Talk about jack leg carpenters. <laughs> DIYers. <laughs> Definitely. And that place had a, had a great yard. But it didn't have a refrigerator. And it didn't have a dryer. It had a washing machine in the kitchen, but no place for a refrigerator. We kept looking around, well, where, where was the refrigerator? Yeah. I looked in the backyard, there was no clothesline. What did they do with the wet laundry? Yeah. It's weird. Okay. So... To do the brick part, you can go in and do this. Up and down with little lines like this. And you want to stagger them like that. I went over this last week, so it doesn't hurt to go over it again. So this will look nice and neat. But there's another way you can do it. If you wanted to imply that this was brick without having to go through all these little blocks, so to speak, what you could do, you could do a couple here at the corner. in a show one time and the judge gave a talk and the judges don't always do this but at this this show they did and I was glad he did because I learned something from his talk and he said you know if you're doing a landscape 
you do not have to put in every tree with every branch with every leaf on that branch all you have to do is suggest the tree and the viewer will say okay that's a tree and this is the mass of leaves on that tree he said basically all you got to do is about 40 percent of what you're looking at and the viewer will fill in the other 60 percent if you tell the viewer everything the viewer won't have anything to add to the viewing experience particularly if they aren't real creative you know if if they're not strong in their drawing ability say and you tell them every single thing you know every blade of grass in the in the yard or every vein in the leaf of every branch you leave them nothing you know they can't use their imagination to say oh well this would work here or this is what they'd left out and and my imagination is filling this in for me you gotta leave them something so this is one way to do that with the, with the brick and you can just sort of do one every so often and the brain will say, oh, well, this is a brick wall. I get that. And be done with it. I think windows look better with shutters beside them. So I'm going to add a couple shutters to a couple of these windows. And there's lots of different ways to make the, the shutters. You know, most of them today are vinyl. In the old days, they were wood and they were functional. And when bad weather came, you know, you pull the shutters in and close up the window and protect the glass. So flying limbs and that sort of thing didn't hit it and break it because glass was so expensive and hard to get. But um, you could do something like, I'll do two different kinds. You could do find the middle here. I wish I had a clear yardstick some days. Do something like this. like that or you could do the louver kind I'm just eyeballing this. Okay. 
I'm getting off a little bit, but you'll get the idea of it. So, Amber, did you get all your pain finished you were doing? Yeah. Got it done. That's good. That was something else about that first house yesterday. Evidently, they did their own painting, and uh, they've gotten paint, paint on the baseboards and on the floor and um, it was just a messy messy job it was a shame okay so I was going to show you how to do the shingles so do the long lines of the shingles first I'll show you why here in a second They should be about the same height. When I'm out here at the va at vanishing point, I always do an X and I always try to split that X with my straight edge. This makes it a little bit more accurate uh, drawing. Okay. So, to make the shingles look like they're laying on the roof, they need to be at the same angle as that line right there, all the way down. So all you gotta do is just slide your ruler down and just like bricks, they, they're staggered. Could be something like this. Like so, all the way down. And if you don't want to do that, you can do the same thing as here to sort of say, okay, here's some shingles. But, oh, okay, that's a shingle roof. If you wanted to get fancy and, and give some depth to these windows, because, you know, the wall is going to be anywhere from that thick to that thick. Um, I, th I think the walls of, like, Notre Dame are, like, 14 feet thick because they didn't have any steel to use. It's all stone. So, what you can do is go back to this vanishing point because it's going to be the third cousin to these lines. Use this one right here. So, here's the, the window sill, the depth. And here's where you can set the geraniums or whatever or pies to cool and here's the thickness of the wall
let's say the door was open part way. You could have it open out or you could have it open in. Let's have it open in. And uh, it's sort of, sort of going to be the same thing. Opens on the left. It's hinged on the left. Just things like that can help make a drawing more interesting. So hopefully that explains two-point perspective. Uh, if you've got more questions, let me know. I'm going to move on to this little drawing. I'm going to do from a photograph. I looked and looked and looked for another one. I'm going to do and I can't find it. Maybe I'll do it from memory. I'll try to. The neat thing about it was it had a couple of vehicles in it. I sort of need vehicles as a reference to get the proportions right and everything. Okay. So, you can... This is an example of one point perspective. I think a lot of times uh, if you're doing urban scenes, I think the alleys behind the buildings are even more interesting than the front or the facades of buildings. And um, this is an example of two point perspective. I'm standing right here so I can turn my head and see all the way down this way. I can see all the way down this way. This is an example of one point perspective because all these angled lines are going to meet somewhere out here in the distance. These uh, dumpsters don't uh, follow that rule because they're setting at a different angle. But all these windows and the tops of the buildings and the tops of the chimneys, all these, even the power lines, all these go back to a, a vanish point somewhere out in here. If you wanted to trace it down, what you could do is, is lay two straight edges. Here's the tops of these windows. I don't have two rules. There's the bottom of the window. So the vanishing point is right here. It's off of the photograph, but that's where all these things line up. And you can check it and double check it, and they all will go right there. Um, So what I'm going to do this is actually two different alleys or two different blocks of the same alley. Um, this is really complicated looking, but if you look at it, it's, it's not that bad. Let me draw it out in pencil and I think you'll see what I'm saying. I'm not going to make it huge. I like the play of the light and the shadow in this. I also like the, the different textures of the road and of the buildings. I also like the cylindrical pipes going up and down. I guess these are transformers or something. And they're on like an eye beam across the alley. So anyway, I'm gonna start with this little area back here in a very far distance. And it's about right here. I'm going to try to draw lightly. And 
It looks like a garage, at least a garage door. It looks like a car, a minivan, sit, or something sitting in front of it there. Vines are a real skinny tree. This is the brick around that building, around that door rather. This, the pencil is going to be more of a sketch and the ink is going to be more of a finished drawing. So hopefully you can see how I build up a drawing like this. And this is obviously all freehanded, I'm not using a ruler or a triangle or anything. I'm not using vanishing points. You know, once you have done enough of these one and two point drawings, you can get away without using them. Unless you're doing something really, really complicated. And then I suggest you go back to them. has brick mailboxes and the house two houses up from us the way I look at it it looks like it's leaning about like this and I've got a four foot level and I'd love to go over there and measure it to see if it's plumb <laughs> if it's sunk son but <laughs> I don't have the nerve I guess I could go out at night with a flashlight uh -huh. but <laughs> I don't know I guess in the in the big scheme of things, it really doesn't matter. I may just end that drawing right there. Not, you know, that sky, so I may just leave that open right there. You know, when you're drawing, you can do creative things. It doesn't have to follow any set rule. I'm going to change that up real fast. I had some things written down I was going to share with you. Uh, I'll show those as I draw. Um, be patient with yourself and your drawing as you're drawing you know don't rush it don't push yourself don't push the drawing it will evolve as will your drawing skill level you're just starting out so one everything is new and two you may be a little timid or intimidated by some of these things that's okay you know you can't eat an elephant but one bite at a time so just take a little bite and move on if you can master those six basic shapes and look for those six basic shapes and everything you're looking at to draw I think you'll be way ahead of all the others you know, I showed you how to basically put them together to make some flowers or a bird. You can do that for anything. Um, one one fun thing you can do, let me find a little more sheet of paper here. Say you wanted to have some fun. You know, we, we drew some steps last week. What if you did steps down? So 
creates sort of an optical illusion. So basically, I'm making it look like you can go down into a piece of paper. always watch American Masters on PBS and they did one on J. Frank Baum, the guy who wrote The Wizard of Oz. Mm -hmm. Well, I didn't realize it, but he wrote a whole bunch of books about Oz and uh, he became very, very famous. I mean, he was as famous as Mark Twain was during his lifetime. But see, doesn't that look like you can go down in, into that sheet of paper? Yeah. You know, just have fun with what you can do. But even in his lifetime, they were doing plays and, and movies of his work. He did not live long enough to see the uh, MGM 1939 Judy Garland, uh, you know, the one we all see. I remember seeing it as a kid on TV. And of course, Everybody had black and white TV, so I didn't know that the middle part was colored. But um, I remember those flying monkeys, they scared the bejesus out of me. <laughs> <laughs> and that old witch. Uh -huh. Sometimes happens. Because I can't get this tall building in somewhere here. Just helps with the sense of scale. Know, up on the second and third stories of these buildings, there's not much detail, but down here there's some awnings and, and door openings and things like that. Actually, this is all brick. I was telling Amber before class, I'm going to get my 
left shoulder replaced next month, and I'm real excited about it. <laughs> I've been trying to get it done for like five years. Uh-huh. I keep manipulating it. And and putting me off and everything. But now it's it's the die has been cast, so to speak. I'm gonna get it. And I'm excited. I know it's gonna be painful and a lot of a lot of physical therapy afterwards, but hey, I'll have a new shoulder. I said to the doc, you know, it's strange that the left wore out before the right. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, the right's not <laughs> far behind. <laughs> so he said, I might be able to get by with just scoping it. I said, well, that would be good. Recovery from that's a lot quicker. Once you start to shade this in with either pencil or, or ink, squint your eyes and that will help you focus on the darks and the lights. I don't need this tape down anymore. garbage can right here. Amber, has the garbage collection always been this way around here? Uh, what do you mean? Uh, well, if you don't live in, say, Kingsport, you're responsible for your own. Oh, I don't know. I've always lived in the city. I see more garbage trucks than I do uh, UPS trucks Sundays. I know my sister lives in, lives in Hawkins County and theirs gets picked up. This seems not very efficient to me. You know, because they'll come to our neighborhood and pick up maybe three people's trash. And the next day they come and pick up seven people's trash. And then the next day they come and pick up 15 people's trash. And that's, that's three trucks. And there's like 70 houses in our neighborhood. If they could just come and pick up everybody's in the same day, it seems like it'd be one trip. Yeah, they do. Done deal. They do my neighborhood on Thursdays. They do my parents' neighborhood on Fridays, so. Yeah, they have them daily here. I don't know about the county. <laughs> you see the Channel 5 news last night at 6? Uh-uh. The residents of uh, Bristol, Virginia, and, and Tennessee both are complaining about the odors from their landfill. And the city manager said, well, you know, we're aware of that. We've, we've been having um, outside people come in for the last five months trying to do something, and... They interviewed this one old boy and he said, smells kind of stinky. <laughs> I'm thinking, why do they always get like the village idiot to, yeah, to the, interview on the TV? <laughs> yeah. Or somebody with some teeth missing or something, uh -huh. you know. He said, it kind of gave me a headache. <laughs> oh well. So it smells a little like garbage. <laughs> smells like garbage. 
stinks a little. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. I'm still cross-referencing myself to see, you know, how much I'm off. We'll find out here in a minute. I gotta put another telephone pole in here. Goes about right here. It's not real straight. That's okay. And the one down here, away from the building. Either. Again, that's okay. Alright, right here there's a doorway. It's an awning that comes out. I don't see any steps. Here's another awning. Another good thing about exploring the alleyways is you can find out what sort of businesses were there at one time and moved on. Found a theater that, had, this is downtown Kingsville here, found a theater that had been there at one time and I, I don't know if it's still there or not. Is there a theater downtown? No, they have that one where, I mean, I know what you're talking about on the end there. I wish they'd open that back up and make it into a theater. I think it'd be cool to go see movies there. They have like a theater where they do plays. I think life. that's what this was. Yeah. So they have a theater. My mom said they used to run movies there when she was a girl. Like you can see the ticket booth and everything. My mother was a real movie buff, but her, the town she lived in was so little, she had to bicycle. And she used to run over with a tram. It was like seven miles over and then seven miles back. And she had one of those old steel, you know, pre-World War II bicycles. The thing must have weighed 50 pounds. Mm -hmm. And uh, uphill, downhill. They tried to go um, as often as her parents had a dime or whatever to spare. During the Depression, that was not very often sometimes. I think anytime you can engage the edges of a drawing, it helps create interest. I don't know what the 
natural view of the story that I'm listening. And here's a photograph. Okay. We'll start with the ink. Draw one more thing in here. Number two. This would be another good way to practice um, varying the marks you use to sort of get the different textures. Once I get all the inking done, and I'm sure it's, it's dry, I'm going to run over it lightly with an eraser and get rid of any pencil lines that are left. You also just do this with any, no preliminary pencil if you want it. If your lines aren't real crisp and sharp in the distance, that's okay. Think of the way photographs look at a distance. You know, they're sort of fuzzy and out of focus anyway. Our eyes sort of work that way too.
just looking for details to add here. Pretty much a garage door there. I'm going to turn my paper so it's easier for me to shade in. Amber, could I get you to do me a, a large favor? Yes. Could you look through these photographs, please, and find me? It's a regular size photograph like this one. Okay. It's a shot looking up a hill, and there's like houses going up on both sides, and there's a truck parked here, and I think there's a truck parked here. I have looked and looked, and I can't find it. I think I think that's uh, called male pattern blindness. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate you helping me. No problem. I like looking at pictures. Not all those I took. Some of them uh, students have given me. Some are like touristy shots, and some are. Uh, were taken to use in classes. Actually, a couple trees back in here. There's not so straight in there. I don't mind a crooked telephone pole because I beam better be straight. I think it's easy to cross hatch with a, a pen a pencil. And again that's where you sort of do like the weave and claw. Make your marks this way and then go back over this way, maybe even that way. It helps makes dark really, really dark. And Really quickly.
one thing I miss about living where I live and ever hear trains. Where I lived before, you could hear trains 24-7. No luck yet? Uh, not so soon. Have you come to the Star Wars wedding yet? No, not yet. One of my students invited me to that. It's pretty cool. Well, I saw London in 1975. Saw what? London. Oh, that wasn't me. Big Ben and London Bridge. And I've been to Scotland, but not England. I wish I could say that, but I can't. You like animated films? Yeah. I watched a thing about uh, uh, Pixar the other night. That was pretty interesting. I don't realize it, but Steve Jobs was involved in that for a while. He floated the money. Trying to make these different buildings look different by the way I'm shading in. Or not shading in. Now if you put your marks pretty close together, it's going to look a lot darker than if you space them out. If you space them out, you can get almost a light gray. Next week, we'll be working with that. Um, ink washes, which uh, I like to do. If you've ever done a watercolor, it's sort of like that. You work light to dark. And again, you have to let the paper dry in between so you don't have things running together and mixing where you don't want them to mix and that sort of thing. But you can get some really cool effects. I was at uh, the Chrysler Museum in North Virginia, I don't know, maybe eight years ago now. Anyway, they had just finished, I don't know, multi, multi-million dollar renovation and they had changed all the galleries around and, and added a couple wings and it, they had displayed everything in chronological order so you walked in the door and you started with like Egyptian art and you moved all the way through and as far as I know that's the only 
museum that ever has done that, and it made perfect sense. I don't know why anybody not thought of it before, but anyway, we made our way through and um, got up to about the third floor, and there's a room full of 19th century paintings. In the middle of this one wall, there was a photograph, and I thought, well, that's strange. But anyway, I made my way around the wall, and I got up to this photograph. Well, it wasn't a photograph. It was an ink drawing, an ink wash drawing, like I'm going to show you how to do next week. But it looked like a photograph. And I don't remember the artist, somebody I never had heard of, French dude. But anyway, it was like mid-19th century, and it, he had done... I don't know, it was the opening of a new bridge or something. Something. So there's like 300 people on this bridge in hoop skirts and tall hats and derby hats and that sort of thing. So it was like lots of bodies and, and the architecture and the lighting and lots and lots of different details and things. It was, it was breathtaking. I mean, even once you got up close to it, it looked like a photograph. I found it. Oh. It just dawned on me. I pulled it last week. I'm sorry. That's all right. That's the only way I can find with the heels is this one. Yeah. It, it just dawned on me. And I like this house. That is on Monhegan Island. And it's the only house there like that. It's pretty. It's it's quite a house. It's a private residence. It's not a um, hotel or anything. I'm sorry I made you look through all those. You're right. I like looking at pictures. I appreciate you doing it. But I've been sitting here thinking, okay, it's not in one of the sketchbooks, it's not in the, my pencil box, where on earth could it be? And then I looked over here at this perspective book, and I thought, I wonder if I stuck it in there. And <laughs> there it is. In there with that dog I, I sort oh, yeah. of started last week. Okay, so anyway, I'm working away on this alley scene still. And about halfway through, speed up a little bit. Um, Funny how both sides of this chimney seem to be in shadow, but that's the way it is. I'll have to do this shading in one perspective on the one side and make make it look like it's the same thing. Part of the same building. One of my favorite artists, Toulouse-Lautrec, worked in pastels and, and gouache and oil and probably mixed media and watercolor and whatnot, but once you see one, you will always know that it's a Toulouse-Lautrec. Well, he had a tragic life. He was uh, from an aristocratic family, but from the age of 13 on, he had some disease and his legs didn't grow. So he's only about, you know, this tall. 
but from the waist up, he was a man. And uh, one of his best friends when he moved to Paris was a doctor. And his, he wore a derby and his friend the doctor was full grown and he wore a top hat. And uh, they must have been, made quite a pair walking down the street. But anyway, uh, he was very, he was a gifted draftsman. And um, he did a lot of illustrations for the different taverns and things in uh, Paris, particularly on the West Bank, like the Moulin Rouge. And um, he became friends with the dancers and the singers and the prostitutes that hung around and all that. And, uh, but all of his work, I don't care if it's a pastel or what, looks almost like an oil painting. I've never seen any other artist pull that off. It's fabulous what he did. It. But he drank himself to death. He had problems. And uh, died early, like in his 30s. If you ever have seen John Houston's um, uh, Moulin Rouge, or the life of, they pronounce it Han Ray, Toulouse Lautrec, um, and of all people, uh, Zsa Zsa Gabor was in it. <laughs> she uh, played one of the singers, and Jose Ferrar played Toulouse Lautrec. And somehow or another, they had him so he was like walking on his knees and his legs always were bent up behind him. It had to be very painful to, to walk like that. But anyway, uh, he won a lot of Oscars. I hope he won an Oscar for Best Actor, but I don't know if he did or not. But it was like 1953, 56, somewhere in there. But it was a very accurate portrayal of his life and times, if anybody wants to watch it. The one that came out about 95 to 2000 with um, uh, I can't think of her name now. She's very pretty. She's Australian. Uh, can you think of her name? Sort of strawberry blonde. Um. Anyway, she she was the dancer and singer and and. It, I forgot who played Toulouse, but anyway, that was pretty good. It was a lot more music-oriented than, than the other one. I read Angelica Houston's autobiography. She was John Houston's daughter. It was it was fascinating, you know, he, he was a hard-charging character. He was a, I think he was an honorary colonel in the Mexican cavalry, and, uh, you know, he, he was in on all sorts of different things. He was an actor and director and screenwriter, and, and he was film, films all over the world. He did a lot of really famous ones like the, the Treasures of Sierra Madre and the African Queen and Moulin Rouge and, and really some cash rusher buster type films. But uh, he lived in Ireland and he had a state there where he liked to gamble. And he liked to gamble on racehorses. He had several. And uh, she woke up one morning and he was there and he said, Angelique, I'm sorry, Angela, what else her name was? Um, anyway, whatever the daughter's name was, uh, Angelica. I'm sorry, but you gotta pack up everything. I lost the house in a poker game last night. We gotta move. Oh, God. <laughs> so they moved. <laughs> I think her mother was a ballerina he'd met somewhere. And he was just a character, you know? Nothing seemed to get him down. 
he directed her in her first movie. I'm not sure if that was uh, Jean Jacques Gabor's first movie or not. I like Ava better anyway. She was the one that was in Green Acres. through with this guy. Kind of started to skip on me anyway. Try this guy out. All these good soldiers are going to deal with here. Yeah. I was going to stop at Michael's on the way in, and I totally forgot. I've been running errands all day. Some days are just like that. Just shaving away here, folks. Hopefully you can see what I'm doing. I'm not doing a lot of talking as I shave. Nicole Kidman. Thank you. God, that was killing me over here. I could not, because I, I knew exactly what you were talking about. Did you think of it or look it up? I thought of it. It finally hit me. Well, thank you. A couple more wires going up here in the sky part. Do wires sag more in the winter or the summer? Power line wires. 
That's your homework for this week, everybody. Check out the wires <laughs> alongside the road somewhere and see if they sag more now or in the winter time. There's actually a drain here in the road. And it's in one point perspective, of course. Great. So there's some strong shadows in here, so let me get those in real fast. this sit log work on the other one before I race the temple lines out. I don't want to smudge anything. But hopefully you'll be able to tell what I drew and then shaded. back and cross hatch a few of these. So there's that. Okay. Do this last one here real fast. Um, flip the teacups and things over so I'm not seeing them through this paper. Okay, so again, up here at the top of the hill, let's do this, get a box. Love working with ink, but it's pretty unforgiving if you make a mistake. So the best thing is don't make mistakes. or something. Locus has got some weird wood. It's um, sort of olive green inside to almost a, a real pretty light tan cream color. It's a soft wood, but it's considered a hard wood because of 
leaves fall off in the fall. You use the furniture a lot for like door bottoms and sides and things. It takes paint well. Road comes down in a section like this. There's a building right here. See part of it. And be like this. Again, this is one point perspective. Roof comes over. Part way. There's another roof that comes in like this. This first roof has got a chimney poking out of it, out like this. This is a, another building coming in like this. That's the ground pipe off of the guttering. Here's the back wall. And right here, we have got the bed of a truck. white truck. Here's the tail light. Bumper. Water panel. Wheel well. How's your new vehicle running? Good. I love it. Great. I looked for it the other day out there and I couldn't see it. I was probably at lunch or so. All of this is in shadow, so I'm just going to go ahead and black it in. Underneath also. I think there's like a bush here. So like a boxwood or some bush like that. Well, it makes this bumper stand out, that's for sure. I did a watercolor of this photograph. I wasn't happy with it. I don't know what I didn't like about it, but anyway, this is already looking better. What I'm doing here is doing some indication of the rafter ends coming out on this little building. In the shadows. Closer to us. I'm going to step off a little bit like this, but it's still going to be getting wider. Oh, laid my hand in wet ink right there. Oh well. 
so we can go on out. Up here, there's a tree. And some more of our favorites, the telephone poles. Here's some greenery. Right here is the front of a Toyota type truck. My last wife had a Toyota station wagon. We nicknamed it Odie. Odie the Toyota. <laughs> Odie the Toyota. It's funny how much black is shown in chrome. Maybe all the symbol has been so bright and shiny, but it picks up everything around it. It can pick up the sky, it can pick up the ground, it can pick up the grass, it can pick up whatever is around it. So that's one thing that makes it kind of difficult. Sort of like that too sometimes. Where the tire on the left side, driver side is, is black, comes over, and where the window well, window well is, is also black, above the tire. So basically, you don't see anything but the wheel. So that's the detail there to deal with, which is cool. I always wondered how wheel designers do what they do. You know, they're, they're limited to a circle. And they're always coming up with new designs. How do they do that? It's all this is going to be fine. See the tire. Maybe we can pass you up in that light. Make a little adjustment here. there on viewer land. We want to see your drawings. We want to hear your questions or your comments. Give us a holler. Give us an image or two. Let us know if we're teaching what you want to learn. Like I said, next week we're going to switch over to ink. building 
coming up here actually. See power through the windshield. Something that's always fascinated me about car designs is, you know, they have to sort of keep what they've done in the past, but yet make it look new and fresh. You can't just come up with something totally off the wall or it'll scare the buyers away. So it's got to look like last year's model, but better. And you got to be able to look at it and say, oh, well, that's a Buick or that's a Cadillac or that's a BMW or whatever. It takes talent to do that. I knew an artist who had actually been a designer for GM. He said that he had been offered every division except Cadillac to, to be the head of. He'd worked there his whole life, his whole career. I didn't get to talk to him long enough to find out, you know, what he liked, which one he liked the best, or what years he worked at, say, Pontiac or Buick or Owls or whatever, but he was, he was a very gifted painter. He did shaped canvases, which not very, very many people do. some buildings in this little guy here. Let me finish this one building real fast. Looks like my finger has found some more wet ink somewhere. <laughs> Never fails. If there's wet paint or wet ink, I'll find it. As always, I uh, thank you for watching and I hope you have a good week of drawing, and we will see you next week. Take care, everybody.